Joining us is the author of Pound Foolish. She's a columnist for the Washington Post, Helene Olin. Welcome back. Oh, thank you for having me on again. People who listen to this show are always telling me how much they love listening to you. So I was surprised to discover that a column you wrote for the Washington Post that I flipped over, it's about Amy Klobuchar. You've been getting hate mail? First, let me say, whoever you are who's like writing fan mail about me to David, you should write me as well, Mm because I really like flattery. Second, I'm not totally sure I believe this, because I think he just wants to be on his show again. Okay. Third, yes, I'm getting tons of hate mail. Not tons. I'm exaggerating. I have gotten a huge chunk of mail this week uh, between Twitter, between Facebook, between in my inbox, because of a piece I wrote about Amy Klobuchar and her alleged office bullying problem. Amy Klobuchar is a Democrat. She's a senator from Minnesota. She stood up to Brett Kavanaugh. And we're getting reports that she has some of the highest office staff turnover in Washington, D.C., that she throws things. Right. Yeah, I was about to say, we're getting more than that, right? It's not just that she has high staff turnover, though that's sort of an indication things might not be correct there. But the reports are from BuzzFeed, from Huffington Post, and from Yahoo, are that she is temperamental, that she's thrown stuff at her staff, that she routinely humiliates staff that she's not happy with in front of other people, uh, by, you know, sends out angry emails in the middle of the night, you know, describing various press releases as the worst I've ever seen, uh, except apparently she says that a lot. Um, has if I'm remembering right, threatened to fire people in front of other people. And according to Yahoo, at least, even when people attempted to get other jobs, then proceeded to call the new employer and say, don't hire them. Um, this is not being a tough boss who is expecting the best of your employees. Let me just put that out there. This is abusive bullying behavior. You can't be a president if you treat your staff like that. It's all about loyalty, isn't it? Well, I think it's a bigger issue. I mean, first, I, no one wants a president like that, right? It's the last – we have one now, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, and we can see how well it's going for all of us. And, you know, to be fair, Klobuchar's office does seem to work, right? But I think it's a much bigger issue. And I think the issue is, is that as a society, we have a huge problem with this stuff. Bullying is kind of as, as a, uh, bullying is as American as apple pie, right? Yeah. We, we worship bullies. Forget apple pie, apple. Yeah. Wasn't Steve right, Jobs? Right, say, yeah. Steve Jobs was a terrible bully. Steve Ballmer at Microsoft allegedly threw furniture at underlings. Um, He's denied it. I have to put that out there. We used to have, we had Neutron Jack at GE. There was Chainsaw Al at at Sunbeam, if anybody remembers him. He just died, We've had a whole host of these people who, you know, are kind of held up. And then it sort of filters outward, right? So you see it. Anybody who has kids has heard and knows that this is a problem at sporting events where the coaches and referees are reporting increased bullying by parents. You can watch it on reality TV, which is a bonanza of bullying behavior, you know, gaslighting, backstabbing, bad mouthing, um, you know, blackballing, you name it, right? Mm -hmm. And finally, of course, as it turns out, There are studies that show that societies that have greater income inequality have greater problems with bullying. Mm. Because the pond is shallow, people are frightened, they can't guarantee their next job, the boss picks up on that, so he or she takes advantage of it. That's presumably it. It's really hard to know what exactly the dynamic is. I, I, you know, are people internalizing, you know, some sort of dog-eat-dog dog values? Uh, you know, are they putting themselves first at the expense of everybody else? Is it a sign of a lack of compassion? I, I, I mean, the theories are kind of endless about it. But what we do know is that when you look at, at least as far as school children go, when you look at bullying behavior, the United States is kind of on par with um, 
the, with the Russian Republic. Wow. We are not on par with Europeans. Canadians are somewhere between us and, I mean, Western Europeans. Um, Canadians are somewhere between us and Western Europeans. I mean, this is just a part of our lives, and it's kind of the background noise. And so anyway, so why I got hate mail. There are a lot of guys I know who think bullying makes you stronger and better. You'll work harder. Do we see evidence that despite the the anguish it causes, that it works in terms of productivity? No. Um, there's no evidence it works. If anything, it seems to discourage. It seems to encourage job turnover, which we all know is not a good thing for the employer. It seems to, the, the surveys show that people at least self-report that they slack off, which kind of makes sense, right? Because at a certain point, if you don't know, if, you know, something is good, it's going to be received well, or if something is bad, it won't. Because that's the other thing about bullies. They're often incredibly erratic, is you're not going to give your best. You're just not. I mean, and then the kicker is it's just the emotional pressure of working under mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And so, which, of course, as we all know, when people are miserable, they always put in their best performance, right? I'm kidding. And right. so it really doesn't really seem to work for very many people. Donald Trump is notorious for this sort of stuff, and we, we have the evidence in front of us about how well the White House works. Right, right. There are different types of bullying. Is there an honesty to the bully who screams and yells and throws things as opposed to the emotionally sensitive bully, the one who doesn't scream, the one who doesn't let you know he or she is bullying them? I think both are pretty wretched, but I will say... Have you ever been oh, on yeah, the I've been on the receiving end of all of the above. You probably have too, right? You've worked in Hollywood. No, no, I do that. I've tried all different forms of bullying and the fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I good think one, the, the, the most evil is the, the boss with the high emotional IQ who knows how to right. bully and he does it or she does it so well that you don't know you're being bullied because they're not screaming and they're not throwing something makes me nostalgic for, you know, Lou Grant from the Mary Tyler Moore show. There's, there's something more honest about throwing a stapler at my head. Right. I mean, I think it's also, frankly, an East Coast versus West Coast style a little bit, mm -hmm. where, you know, East Coast tends to be more direct and the West Coast you tend to get more, you know, um, you know, indirect communication. And I'd say that's overall for, you know, for the for communication styles, but we're going well beyond bullying. Right. But it's they're both they both screw with you in the end. I mean, yeah. I probably would prefer someone throwing something at me too. But mm -hmm. frankly, both are really intolerable. I mean, it's it's sort of choosing between what circle of Dante's Inferno of hell you really <laughs> want to be in. I mean, the one thing I will say though, to me, what stood out in the Klobuchar allegations, there, I guess there were two things that stood out to me, was first, it was just not the bullying of individual staff members, because a lot of times it's done in a kind of gaslighting way where it's not done in front of other people. So, you know, there's kind of a, you know, there's kind of, you know, a weird thing about it where it can kind of seem normal, it was this kind of ritual humiliation of staff, um, you, know, threat, you know, telling people how awful they were in group emails, uh, there was one allegation that she ordered a staff member to go to Al Franken's office and say something like, you know, I, by the way, I'm supposed to tell you I'm the worst assistant she's ever had. <laughs> um, there was, you know, the calling of other employers to, like, tell them not to hire her people. I mean, that's bizarre stuff. I mean, that, that, that's sort of another level beyond. That's and I think that, to me, was what kind of stood out about it. I mean, like you, I probably could tolerate a staple thrower occasionally. People do lose it every so often. I get it. Yeah. But this seemed to be beyond that. Um, and it was kind of interesting because people either kind of got it or didn't. So, you know, I got a lot of mail along the lines of, you know, you're bad-mouthing all, you know, you're, you're taking out a female candidate, you're judging, you know, we don't judge men this harshly. Yeah, they, they immediately said it was sexism. The, the Klobuchar right. camp said when men do this, they're celebrated. 
you know, my position was pretty basic, is that I don't think this should be acceptable when a man does it either, right? Mm -hmm. That was the point of my article, was that we have a bullying culture in this society, and that we shouldn't, you know, that there's always been this tension in the women's movement, and that on one hand, do you aspire to be in leadership, and do you aspire to the you know, the norms of leadership, which are often to be described as this kind of hyper-masculine world, or, though, to be fair, women bully a lot, right, in female settings, too. Or do you want to transform them, right? And you see this play out, in, you know, in feminist arguments over and over again, and in a non-bullying way, it was part of what underlied some of the debate about Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In, right? is do you want to just, you know, wait a minute, you're encouraging people to work at the office and then come home and work? <laughs> you know, like, mm-hmm. that's not the, you know, do we really want that world? I mean, come on, right? I don't. Um, she says, well, she's on the phone at 6.30 at night. <laughs> um, but the, the, the issue with, so the issue with Klobuchar is, do we want to bring the standards to where this sort of behavior is not acceptable? And, this behavior is not acceptable in a lot of cultures, you know, or at least it's more limited in other cultures. We know that. And why are we celebrating this? But so that was where the mail started coming in, that, you know, I must be a Republican, that I hate women, that I'm being a terrible feminist, that, you know, I'm never going to read you again. That's a favorite one. That, yeah. that, that's one of the regular, you know, I'll never read an Olin column again. Um, you know, and... You know, it, it was just, um, I wouldn't say it was disturbing, because, I mean, I've gotten worse, frankly, but it was, it, it surprised me a little, the vociferousness of that, how many people kind of wanted to give this a pass and not talk it out. And, you know, for, you know or, or the other one was, is these are all anonymous accusations, um, which, of course, some of the Me Too stuff was, too, by the way, but you didn't hear it so often when the Me Too stuff came around. So I've gotten into trouble with certain women in my life when, well, I want to be careful here. I used to say, now now I just don't talk. I just don't bring this up. Unless I'm talking to you and all my listeners, then I'll. But I have said in the workplace, I'm not so keen on women taking on the worst attributes of men. I'm hoping that when women come into the workplace, they're going to bring, as you point out, their collaborative nature into the workplace. I don't want to see women being caricatures of men in the workplace. Boy, did I get into trouble for saying that. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's a more nuanced argument than that, because... Well, this, how, this bad is that for me to, how bad is that for me to well, say? They, well, you're falling for a trope, right? Are women really nicer and better than men? You know, I have my doubts about this. I, I mean, I, you know, I know a lot of women, okay? Um, I'm friends with a lot of women. I've spent a lot of time with women. Um, I think this is something we tell ourselves a lot, that women are, you know, are sugar and spice and everything nice. And what were, do- what were boys? Do you remember they were like something in puppy tails? I don't remember what they were, right? You remember that old yeah. time from when we were kids. But we're you aggressive. Know, I mean, but, we're violent. We're trying we're, to, you know... There's always this is stuff that is, you know, societal and that, you know, in fact, you know, the, a lot of times this is things women sort of say to themselves to kind of rationalize what is still to this day a second tier status. Are women really more collaborative or are just women rewarded for being more collaborative, right? That's a simple one. Are women really less violent than men? It seems so. Like they don't go to jail for murder and rape and whatnot so often, right? Mm-hmm. On the other hand, we also know that when you study European history, you know, queens are more likely to go to war than kings, right? Um, Which is kind of one of these interesting findings. And as somebody pointed out to me, that's the equivalent of a double-blind study because, you know, you didn't select, you didn't, this is an inherited job. This isn't like something you, you know, seek out, right? So, you know, there's a question mark about that. You know, are women really, you know, and also the third part of that is, is it's broad generalizations. Even if men are slightly more violent than women, you know, there's a great, you know, spread here of human behavior. And as Julie Nelson, who's studied a lot of women in risk issues, 
And by the way, thinks that it's absolutely untrue that women are more averse to risk than men. The whole the conditions uh, women face are not comparable to men. What about but when Iceland? they are comparable, right? What about Iceland, though? Didn't we learn that when when the women took over Iceland, the banks stopped with the risk? Or taken? is it? Or is it the type of women you hire? You see, you don't. Nobody knows the answer to that, right? Like. So you could say, like, here in the States, we know women's hedge funds perform better than men's, right? This is absolute fact, okay? I mean, again, broad range, right? There's a lot of male hedge funds that are doing spectacularly well, okay? okay. But, you know, if you do the, the entire group and average it out and whatnot, you'll find women run hedge funds do somewhat better than men have run hedge funds. But do women have to be more qualified to set up a hedge fund? It's a lot harder for women to attract money than men. Guys can kind of just show up, right? And somebody hands them money. I mean, we've studied this again. When men are promoted on promise, women are promoted after they prove themselves. So is it simply that women have to meet a higher standard to even get their foot in the door, and therefore they're coming across as better? What do we see at casinos? We see, I don't go into casinos. I can't stand casinos. I see everybody's desperation and right. fear and desperateness to make money, and I like want to run in the other direction. Um, you're, you're about to tell me you love casinos. I know. No, no, I no, um, no. But I, I'm just wondering if we've done any studies on how women gamble versus the way men gamble. I don't know the answer to that. Um, then I'll make one up. Don't. Then I'll make up an answer. Women yeah. are much more prudent when they gamble. They can play. That's probably true. They can play the nickel slots. They can play dollar blackjack, and they like the whole evening. They're not trying to make a killing. They're just trying to make... Oh, I disagree. I've, I've known some female compulsive gamblers over the years. I think they're not trying to make a killing, but again, are they coming from a lower base? You, you have to really start getting in there and like trying to figure that sort of stuff out. I grew up with a landlord whose wife gambled away the family savings at an OTB. Do you remember the OTB? Yeah, I've tr I had the same thing <laughs> in San Francisco. It was the wife. Okay, and by the way, when he found out, he chased her around the apartment with a knife, and my mother had to call the police. Wow. I had a landlord yeah. who gambled away their savings and tried to raise the rent on me. Yeah. Male or female? I don't know. They didn't speak English. Okay. So. Okay, yeah. No, yeah, this was the why we overheard everything, right? Um, my, in fact, my mother taught me how to put a glass to the wall and listen in on their arguments. This is what happens when you grow up in New York City. Women can be compulsive gamblers. There's no question about that. Let's, let's just say that. I do think it's less likely, but there's probably all sorts of reasons for it. How frightened is the, the billionaire class? And is there any way for them to redeem themselves? It feels like everybody, even the right now, I'm even seeing Tucker Carlson saying income inequality is the issue of our time. Right, because it is the issue of our time. And the polls show that, and they've shown this for a while, by the way, this isn't like something that just happened, that you know the vast majority of people would like to see taxes raised on the rich. More recently, they show that the majority of people uh, agree, agree, including, by the way, close to a majority of Republicans, not quite, um, agree with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's proposal to raise the income, marginal income tax rate on millionaires earning more than $10 million a year to 70%. And, you know, you know, hey, you know, nobody likes to be demonized. Like, think of, pity the poor millionaire, right, mm -hmm. or the poor billionaire. You know, this is hard. You know, they've been worshipped by our society for, like, 40 years. You know, they had a little problem in, like, 2008, 2009, but it kind of receded. And all of a sudden, like, people are, like, waking up and realizing, wait a second, that's where the money is, right? It's like, you know, so, you know, that's why you rob the banks. Go where the money is. And they've had a 40-year run of, you know, low tax rates, you know, constant tax breaks. Hey, they had one last year, right? And people are finally beginning to wake up to the fact that this is not a great idea and that um, – do you hold on one second? Sure. I'm sorry. My dog is eating something, and I don't know what. Oh, whatever it is, it's all too late. Okay. Um, people are waking up to the fact that, you know, our society's millionaires and billionaires are not paying their fair share. And it is taxes, isn't it? Even though increasing their taxes 
won't pay for everything. The income inequality stems primarily to the rejiggering of our tax structure. It, it plays a huge factor in it, let's put it that way. Um, there's other things that have crept in as well, but that's one of the major, major components. And it's, you know, it would obviously make a huge dent in it to, you know, raise the taxes it, to a, a point where these, these um, people who are worth that much money are paying their fair share. And the conversation is not what we'll do with the money that we take from the billionaires. The conversation is we have to take this money from the billionaires because it's not just a concentration of wealth, it's a concentration of power, and that's antithetical to a democracy. That's one of the new things I'm learning, because the billionaire class will always say, you're not going to pay for Medicare for all by taxing us. And I've learned, well, no, but you'll have less money, less power, and we'll have more say than you. That's the problem. Right, and we'll also pay for an awful lot of stuff. I mean, there's no question you could pay for more stuff if you tax, you know, millionaires, billionaires at higher tax rates. I mean, to give an example, you know, the actuary analysis of Bernie Sanders just released Social Security plan, which would raise benefits for Social Security, especially for people at the low end, is basically would, you know, fund the system in full for about a little more than 50 years. And one of the ways it would do that is, and the major way it would do that, frankly, is by raising the tax rate, uh, doing away with the payroll tax on income over in excess of $250,000, and by taxing all income for Social Security, so not just earn, you know, earned working income, but capital gains and dividends, which is a way you know, people who are wealthy tend to earn a huge chunk of their money. Now, we used to tax dividends at a, a rate. Higher e rate. As, like, as yeah. though it were income, but was it George W. Bush who lowered the tax on dividends? I think so. Yeah. You're, yeah, I should go look that up, right? I, I think um, that, something I should know. So what are you afraid of? I know Bernie's right. I know AOC is right. Is there a part of you that worries this thing could unravel, that you've drunk so much Kool-Aid that if we piss off the bill? I mean, there's a part of me, after living through 40 years of Reaganomics and the propaganda, that if we piss off... Amazon, and they say, okay, we're not coming to Queens. We're going to take our ball and go play someplace else. If we piss off Wall Street, if we piss off the billionaires, they're going to take their money and go someplace else, and we'll be left with nothing. I mean, that's what I we've think, been trained to believe, right? Right, and I think a lot of people believe that. I, I think that's something that's really important to put out there, is that a lot of people still kind of believe that. They don't like it, but they really think that's how it is. Because, you know, don't underestimate how little Americans know of other societies. Right. You know, compared to, you know, Europeans, you know, go to the next country over for the weekend, right? Mm -hmm. Americans barely speak foreign languages. They don't travel as much. They don't, you know, they don't, they're, we tend to be more in ourselves, so to speak. Um, we have a strong propaganda that we're the best ever, probably because, you know, we haven't had a major war in our country now in about 150 plus years, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Europeans have a living memory of when they, you know, kind of, you know, basically destroyed themselves. Uh, that makes a huge difference in how people perceive themselves as a nation. I, I can't prove that, but I would bet anything on it, right? Um, so, you know, it's very possible that, you know, a lot of people will still come at the end of the day, will say, yeah, you know, we can't do this. You know, these billionaires, if, if we tax them, you know, we won't have an economy left. And I, I don't know what to say to that at a certain point. Do we have an economy left? Because, you know, I see the numbers. I see that we have the lowest unemployment in 50 years. But I look around, I talk to people, and what I'm reading is... Delinquency in auto loans is at a high, not equal to right before the Great Recession. People can't pay their bills. You always talk about this. How, what's the number? 60% right. 
can't come up with a it's, thousand? Yeah, it's about 60, it's over 50%, somewhere between 50 and 60% couldn't come up with about $1,000 if they had to. 40% couldn't come up with 400 It's, I don't know the answer to this. I mean, how bad, to you, me? I can give you both sides of the equation, right? On one hand, we still have very strong job hiring going on. We know this, right? Yeah. On the other hand, dot, dot, dot. The uh, you know auto loan delinquencies and are definitely going up, which is a major issue. We that's generally a trouble sign. I will say on the other side of the equation, it seems to have a lot to do with loosening of the standards and people under the age of thirty, which might indicate a lot of economic pressure on that group. But it also might indicate the traditional thinking about auto loans is that people will pay it before they even pay their mortgage because if their car gets repossessed, they can't get to work. We actually don't live in that world anymore, thanks to Uber and Lyft. So it's very possible there's been some shift in that, but we don't know that. Mm-hmm. I would say the thing that's actually concerned me even more than the auto loans, though I, am, I do find the auto loans to be a red flag, by the way, is that retail sales fell in December for the first time in a December in about a decade. Um, I am beginning to notice something that I last noticed in the the late 2007, early 2008 period, which is um, what I describe as the closing of um, unnecessary stores. you know, stores going out of business that when I walk in and I say, oh, did your landlord refuse to renew your lease? They're like, no, we're just don't, we can't afford the rent anymore. That sort of thing. Um, and I've wondered about that. But again, it's a hard thing to to grab because online shopping has become such a big thing that it's possible that's impacting a lot of this as well, too. And you know, there's concerns. There's definite concerns. And finally, oh, I should say one other thing. Um, There was a survey released this week that showed that a huge number of federal employees had pretty much wiped out their emergency savings um, by the end of the furlough, which was only about four and a half weeks. So that, that, that tells you there wasn't a lot of emergency savings built up. You know, generally, you're told to have... um, you know, three to six months. Um, clearly, federal employees are not doing that. It feels like this country is being kept together by rubber bands and chewing gum and can just completely collapse with one little shock to our economy. It just feels like all of us could go under. I read a speech by Jerome Powell. I believe he's the chairman of the Federal Reserve right now. He was down in Mississippi And he said something that really offended me. He said, I recognize the inequality. We have to do better. But it's really not the job of the Federal Reserve to help the the disenfranchised. We do monetary policy. Helping the poor is fiscal policy, and that's up to Congress. And I thought, really? Because I've been sold that Monetary policy, the Federal Reserve, the free market, keeping the government off our backs will help everybody. That the solution to poverty is getting government out of the way and letting the free market. Yeah, what I would say is that the Federal Reserve isn't political in the way you think of as political, but it is political because every decision they make has political consequences. So for the past 30, 40 years, they've prioritized fighting inflation over unemployment figures, for example, right? To them, that is the major issue. That is a political decision, and that is a decision that's had huge ramifications on a lot of people's lives because the the, the economy, you know, they've cracked down whenever they think inflation is going to pick up, which has sometimes cracked down on periods where people are getting hired or people are getting salary raises. And that's, you know, a decision. The second part of this is, is it's all well and good to say that. These are sound like slightly contradictory thoughts, by the way, and I'm sorry. But the fact is, is Congress has basically, because of the fact we have one party that has refused to work with the other now for almost a decade, has essentially no role in this anymore. And you could say, yes, 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 they're supposed to do that. But that's kind of like 
me after, you know, if a child of mine snuck and ate the dessert that I was serving before the dinner party, um, which hasn't happened in a while, but used to once happened when they were little, you know, me saying, well, they weren't supposed to do that. But you still have to deal with it, right? You is still have to give people dessert. Historically speaking, now, the Federal Reserve is about 100 years old. It It feels like Congress and the president have abdicated all responsibility for the economy, they've abdicated it to the Federal Reserve. There was a time when Congress and the president would formulate budgets to stimulate the economy and deal with inflation. You know, well, that's because we have a non-functioning Congress at this point, which I would say most of the blame goes to, you know, one party here. I it's- think we're afraid to democratize our economy. I think the central bankers have convinced Americans that politicians are too stupid and the American people are too stupid to figure out what kind of economy they want. It has to be left to the central bankers. I don't know if that's true as much as the fact that Congress basically falling down on the job has done the same thing. And is the divide between inflation and unemployment, also the divide between the richest 1% and the 99%. Would you say that the 99% care less about inflation than they do employment and that the 1%? Well, employment and unemployment and wage gains. I mean, wage gains is actually the biggest issue in this of all. I should say that. Right. Um, The the 1% definitively care more about inflation than wage gains for the rest of us. There's no question about that. So let's circle Uh, that. that. Let's circle that because that's not talked about. So let's, before you go, let's circle that, underline it. The Federal Reserve, as I understand it, the mandate was to keep inflation low and the unemployment rate low. We have seen since Volcker, who was appointed by Jimmy Carter, that the Federal Reserve now only cares about inflation, only cares about giving us a strong dollar. And that is servicing the best interests of the richest 1%. The richest 1% care more about inflation than they do full employment. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think that's a fair, I mean, I think that's a fair statement. I mean, I wouldn't say the 1% in and of themselves, but I would say the people who are doing the policy for, you know, thinking about their needs. How about that? Right. So the central bankers only care about inflation. We saw that in 2009 after the Great Recession. They would be opposed to any fiscal stimulus, any... I wouldn't say that's true. I mean, they, you know, they... You know, the Fed did as much stimulus as they could. Part of the issue was when the Fed, you know, tried, you know, tried to compensate for the fact that Congress did a very, keep in mind, a lot of this for the fault of the stimulus issues in 2008, 2009, falls in 2010, falls to Congress, right? Because what happened was, is Obama was, did not ask, probably because he thought he couldn't get it through, for a bigger stimulus, right? He asked mm-hmm. for one that was too small. We all know that. He, you know, he got through. Um, at the time, it was a Democratic Congress, so probably could have gotten bigger one through, but he didn't do it. By the time he realized that he needed a bigger one, there was no way to get that one through. The Federal Reserve, you know, eased up the monetary supply, you know, um, made interest rates exceedingly low, you know, and really did what they could, right? I'm not saying they're heroes of the story, but they did do what they could. The problem is, is when the Federal Reserve did that, the Federal Reserve doesn't have the control Congress has, right? Congress can, you know, put money into infrastructure. Congress can give you a tax break. You know, Congress can fill in the blank, right? They can get money into people's pockets pretty darn quick. The Federal Reserve can't do that. They can only you know, ease the, mon- ease the supply. So what happened is, is most of the gain ended up going to the 1%, it is essentially the, you know, of, and we started to have all this money sloshing around the system. And that's why, you know, that ran up the stock market because this money had to go somewhere. It's what ran up real estate prices or part of what ran up real estate prices. It's probably somewhat behind, you know, the surge in investment in Silicon Valley. You know, again, this money had to go somewhere because when rich people get more money as opposed to poor people or middle class people or even upper middle class people, they don't spend it as much, 
right? How many, you know, how many boats can you possibly use in your life, right? More to the point, you know, poor people get a tax break. They spend the money. They need the money. Rich people get a tax break. They put the money in a savings account. They put it in the stock market. They put it in a company that might or might not make good. They might buy an extra boat or two. But they're not using it the way you or I would use the money. Am I wrong for thinking that if you were to ask Ray, is it Ray Diallo or Do- Do- these hedge fund men? Ray Dal- yeah, I'm not going to get his name right yeah. either, so don't ask him. But if you sit these... Ray Dalio. Ray, Ray Dalio. Dalio. That's it. Okay. If you sit these hedge fund managers down, if you sit down anybody who has a billion dollars, do they believe that if you have an infrastructure bill that passes and you pump a trillion dollars into the economy... That, and that money on an infrastructure bill, supposedly, if Trump is administering it, it'll go to all his friends. But a fair and just infrastructure bill would pump a trillion dollars at the middle class. Do they fear that would cause rampant inflation? I think they do. It doesn't seem very reasonable to me or you. But you know, I, I think I think one of the things about human nature is that you know, we're forever the heroes of our own story, and we forever rationalize what's in our best interests, right? Nobody goes to bed at night thinking they were a bad person, or very few people anyway. I do. So I think what I think, <laughs> <laughs> I remember every ba- every dumb thing I said all day, <laughs> but like, no, oh, no. Um, but most people don't, like, think they're, like, you know, like, they don't. You know, they don't. They misread their interests for everybody's interests. It's right. a pretty normal process to right. go through. Right. And I think that it, they probably genuinely believe this stuff. I, I don't think they're like evil henchmen. You know, in a in the Joker's lair in Batman, going you know, rubbing their hands to going. Ee! I think that they legitimately believe this, but what they legitimately believe happens to serve what I would describe as their own short term best interests. And the reason I say short term is because they ultimately live in the same society we do. And, you know, as this gets worse and worse, they're going to be impacted by it, too. I mean, nobody wants to live in the world inequality makes. It impacts everybody. People live, 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 even wealthy people live shorter lifespans in more unequal societies than they do in societies that are equal. Or more equal, I should say. Piketty wrote about wealth inequality about four years ago and he was so prescient because the speed at which the inequality travels it's exponential in four years you you cannot stop the inequality without government policy we have an election coming up in 2020 november of 2020 is a long time away and we're due for a recession Now, we might have a collapse of capitalism, which is a reasonable expectation. I think we didn't really learn our lessons from 2008. I think the banks are probably not as over leveraged as they were in 2008. I think some of Dodd-Frank has worked, but debt is massive right now in corporate america student loans auto loan i mean we have massive debt in this country so what happens to capitalism what happens in 2020 when the economy collapses again that's a crisis i have a lot of faith in capitalism i have to say that i mean i it has survived a lot i give it credit right it's going to survive more the thing that kind of scares me for whenever there is a recession next is that most people still haven't really recovered from the last one Mm -hmm. and i'll go back to what i said earlier about the federal workers and how many of them blew through their emergency savings in four and a half weeks and you know a huge 25 percent of them turned up at food banks um i wish i could remember the other numbers from this but not a not small portion were like you know needed to you know, get loans, were pawning their belongings, I think around 10% or something. Uh, you know, and that's four and a half weeks, okay? And on one hand, that's an awful long time to not get your paycheck when you're supposed to get it. On the other hand, it's four and a half weeks. And 
I'm not saying they're irresponsible. What I'm saying is, is most people didn't really recover from the first time around. So what, or the last time around, it's not the first time around. And what are they going to do? And how is that going to impact all of us as people are scrambling? And I don't know the answer to that. But one answer might be is to remember the retail sales number that fell unexpectedly for the month of December, which coincided not just with the federal the, the federal shutdown, which you know impacted the last week or so, and probably the weeks prior going in because people who were in that position were probably scared, but also you know was a major downward slide in the stock market, yeah, which you've all kind of already forgotten about. But it was a major slide. And I will tell you, it certainly impacted my spending that month. And I'm sure it impacted a lot of other people's spending, too. And it, these things, you know, have a way of sort of building on themselves. So when people don't have money, they don't have money. It increases wealth inequality. If there's another recession and we don't do something... If we don't start taxing the billionaires, what happens is the wealth inequality increases because there's a recession, the stock market goes down, real estate prices go down, people who are affected by the recession start selling everything, so things become cheaper, and the people with cash are the richest 1%, the billionaires, they swoop in and buy everything at a bargain. Cash becomes well, king. Well, there's also another complication to that, which is, or not a complication, another part of that, which is generally people who have money in the stock market can, you know, are generally wealthier, can get generally sit it out for the most part. Um, but always remember, you know, you think of people who have their 401ks, that's a pretty small portion, I mean, you know, of the market in a way. Most people who are in the market are fairly wealthy. And they don't have to actually sell into any of this. Um, you know, ditto real estate. But what happens is, is real estate doesn't grow as fast as the stock market, or at least historically has not. Things can always change. Um, I always like to put that caveat out there, right? Mm -hmm. um, things do occasionally change. And, you know, most people's wealth is in real estate. And that's one of the reasons why there's actually been a growing gap, is because the stock market grew exponentially after 2008, 2009. Real estate not so fast. Um, it grew quite a bit in areas, you know, the, the, the high, you know, very prosperous areas like New York, like LA, like San Francisco, but not everywhere. And even then it wasn't still for the most part. Um, San Francisco might be an exception. I actually don't know the answer to this, but the growth there has been astronomical, you know, still really didn't keep pace with stock market gains. So, you know, over time, Capital investment is going to make you wealthier than land investment, um, whether it's business, whether it's stocks. We're finding that home ownership has gone down in America, and what is propping up the real estate market is private equity buying all these foreclosed homes and turning America into renters. Not just private equity. Keep in mind, in, in the major cities, you also have, or had till very recently, um, huge surges of money coming from outside the country coming in. And that was also having a huge impact on places like New York, like Miami, like uh, Los Angeles, like Seattle, um, probably about 10 cities where it was having a major impact. But don't underestimate that part of it. Yeah. But second, you know, which is why one of the reasons why real estate in these, some of these cities is more expensive. But second to that was, in fact, yes, there was a huge surge of private equity was scooping up all these homes in more middle class areas where, you know, where, um, I don't know, where a Chinese multimillionaire is less likely to want to stash his money, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, they want to stash their money in a condo in Manhattan or a house, you know, in San Gabriel Valley. They probably don't want to, to stash their money in a house in a mid middle class suburb 30 miles outside of Atlanta. Um, you know, and that's where the type of place where the private equity came in and really started scooping up you know, properties and drove the prices up. Drove the prices um, the up. Other, 
Yeah. Right. And the other thing was, was also there was also a lot of private equity money coming into places like Los Angeles, you know, that was flipping. I'm, I'm sure you saw this, right? Yeah. You know, where, you know, they buy a house and redo it quickly. You see this a lot in San Francisco, too, in Oakland, you know, and then double, you know, put it on the market nine months later for twice as much money, you know, maybe, you know, add a bedroom, repaint the place, you know, put in new appliances and gussy it up in other ways. Um, it's really infuriating because money, Wall Street, will securitize anything. They securitized mortgages, that collapsed the economy, and now they're discovering that they can securitize the actual homes, that these private equity firms and these companies will go buy 5,000 homes in Florida and then turn them into securities, turn them into actual stocks that you can trade on Wall Street, it inflates the price of a home and it turns people who were once able to buy a home into renters. We're becoming serfs. If you don't regulate capitalism, we will all end up being serfs. Right. And then that's the important point, right? That we haven't really, we've pulled back on regulation for the past 40 years. When you don't regulate, you know, you know, everything finds its level, and the level is usually at the bottom yeah. because there's always one, at least one bad player, right? And the minute that one bad player steps up, everybody needs to become a bad player. Exactly. Because, exactly. Right. You know, so, you know, in an equitable society, everybody should welcome regulation to prevent this sort of thing. You don't need to give a perfect example. There's actually a fairly easy way to deal with the surge of, you know, cash coming from abroad into the country, which we eventually did, which was to stop letting people buy, you know, properties with anonymous shell companies mm -hmm. and to say, where the heck is your money coming from? This takes care of some portion of it, doesn't take care of all of it, but it certainly, you know, takes care of a fairly decent sized portion of it. And surprise, surprise, you know, once we did that, the huge surges in New York seemed to slow down. About a trillion dollars a year leaves countries like Saudi Arabia, China, and Russia, and the EU is cracking down on that money. But right. American bankers, they're going, ah, well, it's, this is good. This is good. Don't touch it. Don't, don't, don't look into it. Better we don't know. Yeah. Right. And, you know, the other thing is, is, you know, for the longest time, you know, real estate was kind of a way around cash laundering regulations. You know, if you move money at the bank, if you move anything more than, ten, you know, $9,999, they got to make an automatic report. You know, you take it out, they want to know about it, you know, it's, or put it in. You know, they want to know where is all this cash coming from. You, know, you buy real estate with a shoebox full of cash. Nobody has to say anything. It was a huge loophole. <sighs> Very infuriating. Helene Olin is the author of Pound Foolish, Go Buy It. Please go buy Pound Foolish. Go buy the index card and read her over at the Washington Post. Thank you so much. Can you stand the line for one second? Of course I can. Thank you.